All right, so uh, in a binary star system, basically what we have is two different stars that are co-orbiting the same center of mass. So center of mass just means um, it's the point that is um, halfway between the average mass of the system. So that's always gonna be closer to the more massive star. It's kind of like if you were going to uh, put two stars on a scale, the center of mass would need to be closer to the bigger star uh, in order to balance out the balance, the scale. So um, both of the stars are orbiting around the center of mass. And for simplicity, your textbook has basically just collapsed this whole situation to two stars orbiting on the same ellipse. But strictly speaking, the, the more complicated picture is this, um, you know, two stars orbiting around a common center. And binary star systems are actually pretty common. About half of stars are in a binary star system. So our sun, unfortunately, is you know a lonely singleton, um, but all, all the other stars, well, not all the other stars, many other stars are part of binaries. And um, as we see in the activity, the binary star system, when neither star is moving toward or away from the earth, um, just if, if both stars are the same type as in this diagram where we're showing two yellow stars, then we would have only one, you know, one spectral line that we would measure let's say we've you know, chosen some strong spectral line from this system. Uh, but then when the stars are in a configuration such that one is moving toward the earth and one is moving away, then the light from the star moving toward the earth would be blue shifted. The light from the star moving away would be red shifted. And so we would see the one spectral line separate out into two. And the faster the star is moving, then the more those spectral lines are going to, to be separated. So by using the Doppler shift, we can measure the speed of the stars in their orbit. And uh, this can give us information about both the orbital size and the orbital time. So we can you know, watch the Doppler shift over time to figure out what the orbital time is for both of those stars. And we can also get the orbital size by combining that timing with the speed measurement. All right, I'm not gonna go into the details because they're actually pretty complicated. Um, but once we have the speed uh, or the orbital size and the orbital time, then we can calculate the mass. And what we get is the mass of the entire system. So this is, um, you know, maybe you would think this isn't that useful because we can't get the mass of just one of those stars. We can only get the mass of both stars together. But it actually is one of the only ways that we have to measure mass um, with one important exception which is that this same logic can be used to measure the mass of stars with exoplanets. So if we can um, measure, detect the stars that are, or the planets that are around stars, um, there are actually two different ways to do that. One of them is this same um, Doppler shift method where the planet actually causes the star to wobble a little bit as it orbits and that causes a small Doppler shift. So that's one way that we can measure um, exoplanets and that can also give us the mass of the star. And so once we have the mass of the stars, we can start to you know, catalog all of their different masses and see if there's any trends that we notice with other stellar properties. Um, and in fact, there, this is a kind of a cool animation. I guess I forgot this slide was here, but let me pull it up. So this is just an illustration of a situation where uh, the center of mass is kind of at the center of uh, a binary system, this could be a situation where you have an exoplanet and a star. And what you would be watching is the Doppler shift from the star. All right, so by, by using the amount of shift at different, at different you know, periods of time, we can actually map out the speed of the star. Okay, so when we actually look at all the masses of different stars and then correlate that with other variables, uh, one of the relationships we find is that the luminosity of stars is dependent on the mass. And um, this is, you know, this graph looks linear, but don't be fooled. Both of these axes are on a logarithmic scale. So they're, they're not a linear scale, you'll notice that it's not going from one to two here in luminosity, it's going from one to 100. So that means that as mass increases, luminosity doesn't just increase uh, linearly, but in fact, it increases as the mass to the power of uh, 3.9. So nature did not give us a nice round number. Oh, well, too bad. 
uh, but it does, it, it is, um, you know, a powerful influence on luminosity. So this is uh, what we would call an empirical relationship. This is a relationship that we didn't know about theoretically, but that we uncovered based on the data. So um, just to, you know, try to start reasoning about these log log plots, which we'll do more of on Wednesday. Suppose that we have a star with two solar masses. What would you say its luminosity is approximately? All right, so um, you may not have practice with reading log log plots, which is why I'm asking you this question. So I'm going to go ahead and draw on the slide here, and try to illustrate uh, some of what I want you to see. So um, let's say I've got my star with two solar masses. So I'm going to draw a line up to my data from my mass axis. And then I'm going to draw a line to the left. And if we have, you know, this um, star with two solar masses, the place where it ends up on the luminosity axis looks like it's somewhere between one and 100, right? Um, so you might think, okay, if it's between one and 100, a little bit closer to 100, maybe that's about 50, right? But it turns out that when you're looking at a log log plot, um, each tick mark on an axis is really far, the first one is really far away from kind of like starting from one and going to two would actually be a jump that's quite far. And then to go to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 would get progressively closer together. And so it turns out that this is not close to 50, but it's actually closer to 15. So this is just one of the weirdnesses of, of reading a log log plot. And it's why I think it's more useful to actually know the scaling of this relationship. So I didn't actually write that on the slide, but um, the luminosity goes as the mass to the power of 3.9. So if you take two to the 3.9, you'll get somewhere around 16. All right. And the other thing I want to point out is that these are scaled in terms of um, solar units. So we are looking at the mass in solar masses and the luminosity in terms of the luminosity of the sun. Um, we'll play around with log log plots again on Wednesday to get a little bit more comfortable. But I did want to point out that um, they're a little bit hard to read. And so I think paying attention to the scaling, um, the actual numeric number is more useful.